Hey there, and welcome to the daily podcast where wisdom smacks us with kisses or love taps. I'm Michelle Spiva, a wisdom strengthening coach, your host, and practical priestess of wisdom. Join us daily to gain wisdom and mental strength as we tackle innovative thinking, address emotional and behavioral life traps, and yes, provide you with some practical how-tos to wrap it all up. So settle in or crank up the speed 2x, whatever gets your mental processes firing as we dive in. Stay tuned. Hey there, it's Michelle Spiva, your practical priestess of wisdom with today's podcast of Wisdom Smack. I want you to stick with me because today we're actually going to be talking about how to survive and thrive in this new economy, this new way of living. And we're going to be talking about this fallacy of people wanting to always have the silver bullets and the golden geese, the golden eggs, always wanting to always hit the spot on the first try. So stick with me as we delve into of silver bullets and golden eggs. I will see you on the flip. Hey there, thank you so much for joining me. So we're going to go on and get into it today. We're going to be talking about of silver bullets and golden eggs. Now, the reason why I'm coming to you with this one today is because I have been able to sit back, take note and make some notes about what is driving a lot of people's egos these days. Now, we all have an ego that's neither here nor there, and we're not going to vilify our egos. But what I am going to say is when you are able to slow down and take time to be retrospective, to go back and review things, more of the nuances of what's afloat uh, start making itself known to you. And what I'm saying is that a lot of us want those silver bullets, you know, that one shot gets it all, those golden eggs that we always just want to cut to the chase of the thing that's going to be the one for us. And it is becoming more of what we expect than what we strive for. And there is a, there is a reason why this is uh, needful to uh, take a look at. Because wisdom doesn't work that way. Wisdom wants us to understand that, yes, sometimes you will get that silver bullet that hits the bullseye. Sometimes you will find that golden egg, that honeypot, whatever you want to call it, that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow that continuously keeps on giving. But that is a, uh, a miracle sometimes more than the norm. So it's time to break out of that. And it's time to learn from all of the examples that are around us. Yesterday, when we talked, I talked about a Forbes article that I read talking about uh, uh, an individual who uh, needed to have his uh, status as a billionaire touted and and why he, he needed that to be said. And uh, I didn't try to, you know, go too far into it, but he is a product uh, he's not a symptom. He's not a cause. He is a product of of our programming, of how we have been looking at our world. And now that we are being forced <laughs> by things outside of our control, aka a virus, we are being forced to slow down and we're being forced to take a look at those drivers that we thought were pertinent to our survival. And I'll tell you, a lot of fashion the fashion industry is uh, starting to understand that they are truly a dis- part of the discretionable part of income. Because if you don't have to go anywhere, you're not trying to buy you know, clothes to have a fashion show in your house. And so they need for us to you know, work. And because of that, some of the people who are either in that industry or adjacent to it are still needing for us to see them as being okay, being, you know, status and and all of that. Because if they can continue to get us to look at them as the aspiration, 
then they can hawk their wares to us and keep their companies afloat. I don't have any problems with their hustle, and this is not a critique on them. This is simply an observation. But when it comes to understanding silver bullets and golden eggs as they stand right now in our new normal, I'm going to tell you that a lot can be said of understanding the need for stealth moves and few words. All right. How many of you know it's hard to shoot a ghost? It's hard to capture a shadow. And that is where the opportunity lies in the now for a lot of people who are trying to make boss moves, who are trying to secure their futures, and for those that are trying to uh, find their stability in a new economy. Because yes, there's a new economy emerging. We don't quite know what it looks like, but we are in the midst of history being made of how we go about uh, negotiating our, our livelihoods. We don't even know if it's going to continue to be capitalism as the norm. We don't know if we're, we're going to continue to use fiat money for the different countries or if it's going to come become a credit system. Everything is up in the air. But what we can know is that in the meantime and in between time, History has shown that those who move in the shadows tend to be able to be to move unimpeded, unhindered. And so it is time for us to look at how to produce these silver bullets and golden eggs by being ninja like being in the shadows. So the first thing, this is kind of like Fight Club. All those rules about you don't talk about Fight Club, (laughs) you don't mention Fight Club and all that kind of stuff. That is going to be what uh, I want you to uh, hold dear in how you are putting yours together. Uh, Talking about your goals and aspirations to the wrong people before you start kills them. We already have scientific evidence about that. Uh, What I also want you to understand is that um, you need to qualify who you talk with. In the early stages of when you're trying to make your moves, um, you need to look at who deserves to know this. And not only that, you need to look at how do I feel after I talk to this particular person about it? And that part, I think, is more uh, important than who need who deserves to know about this. And the reason why I say that is because there are some people that if you tell something to them, you feel satiated, like you've actually done the work because they're not going to require anything of you. They're not going to require that you be accountable to show that you're actually moving forward. What they're going to do is they're going to cheer you on, you know, throw the pom-poms for you, even bake the cake because, oh, you had a great idea and you're going to feel satisfied and become complacent. But there are those other people that if you tell that to, you know that they silently over in the corner corner doing the Lord's work of judging you to be like, "Mm -hmm, you did all that talking and look at you, look at you, you ain't doing nothing. You know, there are going to be some people that you tell this to and they're going to expect you to manifest it. And if you don't have those types of people in your life or in your surroundings, then the best thing to do is to journal about it. Keep your mouth shut and talk to a plant. Years and years ago, when I uh, would do uh, counseling for premarital couples, one of the biggest things I would have them do is to learn how to curb their talking to their friends and families about each other and talk to a plant. Because a plant is a win-win situation. You talk to that plant, that plant gets your carbon dioxide, and then they fill your house and your space with oxygen. So talk away. And they don't tell your business. You know, so... That's going to be one of the biggest things about creating these silver bullets and golden eggs in the new uh, normal that we find ourselves in. You have to treat it like Flight Club. We don't talk about it. We just move in the stealth and we use few words. So only now this is the next part about what the, you know, the talking about or whatever. Um, only show or allow it to be seen what you're working on when it's about 90 percent done. Now, there are going to be parts of it that can't that are uh, unavoidable. People are going to see some of the parts because it's unavoidable. But they don't have to know all of the moving parts to what you're putting together. You see, a lot of people do nothing but wait to see what others are doing 
and make them a de facto or a quasi leader for what they should be doing. Now, on a stack of Bibles, they probably say, oh, I don't do that. But in their actions, that's what they do. They wait to see what the true movers and shakers are doing to give them direction on what to do next. And it's not a bad thing. Some people are just not wired or, or they haven't taken the necessary steps to do what it, what it takes and requires for them to move confidently on their own without any uh, feedback to say, oh, this is right or this is good. But if that be the case and you don't want them ruining your opportunity to have your silver bullets and your golden eggs, then you need to make sure that you don't show or tell what you've got going on until at least 90% of it is done. That brings me to this next part that's real important. It's, 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 it's simple, but it is hard. And that is honing your skills so that you become very good at what you do. Uh, as a writer, what I find is there are times when I can produce a lot of writing. And then I hit this point where I'm like, mm, I don't like this. And I, so I go back and I study my craft more and I write slower. And I, I used to get down on myself. But then I had to remember, as long as I'm progressing, I'm learning, I'm growing from strength to strength, glory to glory, level to level. And that's part of honing your skill. There are many things that I look at now that I've written years ago and I cringe. I'm like, how did I ever think this was okay to release to the world? And yet still, people buy it. I'm thankful for it. Very grateful. So I'm not despising it. And I actually made a rule to stop unpublishing my embarrassing works uh, from times gone by. Thank goodness I write in different pen names or I'd really um, have egg on my face. But I digress. Let me get back to this. Honing, your, honing in on those conceptual insights and the practices that you get by working on something in a consistent manner is going to make you unique. It's going to change your perception of how you create and, and how you make your creations. One of the people that is a great example, if you want to see what this actually looks like, is to study the periods of Picasso. It is true lines of demarcation of what was influencing him and what was he ex um, playing around with, experimenting with, and the like. You know, from his cubism to his blue period to all of these different moments and movements of what he did as an artist, we see that this man was a master and he, he never stopped working on sharpening those skills. And being willing to totally abandon what he thought he knew to come up with something better. And so to be able to learn how to interact with your concepts and your insights by putting them to practice is really hard and humbling, but it's, uh, it's satisfying and rewarding. And the reason why it's hard is because concepts don't come with manuals. They come with ideas and sparks and they come with a lot of frustration. There is this uh, model that I teach uh, to myself and to my students called create and create anxiety. And it's where you put creation and anxiety together. And it's called create anxiety. And what that means is, is when you trigger off uh, a process of being creative to the point to the point of being active on it, when you first start working on that, uh, that spark of inspiration, to put it into action, to, to make it into something tangible that can be shared and appreciated by others, you trigger the process of anxiety. And then you go into this valley of despair, if you will, where you go through times of self-doubt, confusion, worry, and even depression. There is a great amount of frustration that happens, and it's part of the process that you have to go through because of the fact that you are a mortal being birthing immortality into this world. So you go from the desire at the beginning, you get this desire to create something. And then you, if you're going to put action to it, you start activating your creative energy to, to get some form and direction and, and maybe even a plan. But whoa, 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 whoa. When you start to create, that's when you trigger anxiety. And then there is that, like I said, the frustration of the unknown. Now, this part, I usually call this the, um, the valley of despair, because anxiety is here and now you're frustrated because you don't know what to do. You, it's not like you can go and watch a YouTube video 
to figure out how to move forward because this is your creation. It came to you. There's, there is no manual or model to tell you what to do next. So you have to fight through this frustration of the unknown. This is where a lot of people stop. And if you stop, I'm going to just tell you now, if you stop right here where anxiety has triggered this frustration of the unknown because you're trying to move forward, be careful because depression is just a blink away. But if you keep going forward, even through the frustration of not knowing, you're going to go through emotional struggle, but it does not have to be depression that stops you in your tracks. Yeah, you might feel frustrated and and you might feel a little depressed, but you keep moving forward. And as you move forward and you work with that emotional struggle, you start getting into a failure cycle. And a failure cycle is a try cycle. It's where you try something, it doesn't work, you scrap it, you start over, or you tweak and you refine. But you also start to learn and you start to change and become the person who is worthy and able and and deserving of the creation that you're birthing. So once you go through this uh, this failure cycle, then you start moving into what I like to call the, the promised land, where you start to get that initial production. Maybe it's a first draft. Maybe it's complete enough of a concept to illustrate what you want to do. Maybe it is the shoulders that you will stand on to produce your final work. But whatever it is, it is a production that you fought for and you got some pride about it. But then after that, because of this create anxiety uh, cycle that you go through, you start to be able to get a little distance from it and look at your creation to see, oh, okay, this was just the birth. This was the first draft. It can be tweaked. It can be refined. And so you move into that refinement where you start, if it's, if it's writing, you start uh, polishing it and getting it edited and getting insights from your alpha and your beta readers. Or if it's a painting, you start working with the, the, uh, the light points and the inflections and the mixes and the mediums and all of these other things that help to give it a polish. And once you go through that refinement, guess what happens? You come up with a published work. So whereas you started with a desire to create and you end up with a published work, that is the create anxiety process that we go through. But most people don't realize that it is a process and they think, that when you see someone who has a production, something has that has been produced, that there is some type of silver bullet or golden hen that you can procure to cast this off all the time. And it doesn't work like that. And the way it works now, we're used to boast about, oh, I got this happening, this popping, and I'm working with this person and that person. Nowadays, you better hush and just go take your lumps and your bumps in your create anxiety process in quiet. Move in stealth with few words. Because during this time, you are going to have to become confident that only those who are supposed to know are going to be able to influence and give you input. Because this is the time when you learn to develop your strategies. You learn to know the difference between a strategy and a tactic to get done what it is you need to do. And this is the part that I really love. And uh, I got inspired by this, by a recent post by uh, uh, Seth Godin from his blog. And he didn't say it this way, but this is how uh, wisdom came to me about it. And that is, you need to have your containers before your content. You need to develop your shapes before your colors. And you need to understand that you have to have boundaries before you can have the land. And what I mean by that is that when you're going through this process, it's going to be all over the place because you don't know exactly what it's going to come out. You got maybe a vague idea of what you want to produce, but you don't know all the intricacies and the routes and all of that. And when you go through all of this, and it's a whole bunch of mess, and it's all over the place. It looks like a mess. And these days, because of the, the, the fact that we are swinging from the side of producing ideas back to the side of producing things, of becoming more of makers, you're going to get great criticism if your stuff looks raggedy or unfinished. 
And so being quiet to refine your process, remember I said, you don't need to be letting anybody know what you're doing until it's at least 90% done, is because when you let it out too soon, people can steal it and they can bring it to fruition and then they can claim that they did it and they can take all the market share. If it's something that you're trying to make as a livelihood, they can take their reputation or whatever. They can say, oh, you just inspired me or whatever. So keep your mouth shut and get through the process of getting that rough draft finished. Then you start, when you start tweaking and polishing, this is when you get into learning how to do all these containers and the shapes and the boundaries and all that stuff that's needed for you to be able to have some type of management and control over the creation that you're producing. When I was young and um, getting coloring books, I remember the way uh, I was taught to color by some of my older cousins. They would tell me, trace the outlines of the object before you color them in. That makes it look prettier. That makes it look like it's a, a, um, a picture instead of a little kid, you know, just coloring. Because when you get outside the lines, It might look good to you, but it looks like trash to other people. And I remember them telling me that as a little kid. And so I would take my time and I would trace those lines. And then I got to where I started understanding shadings, honey. You can't tell me nothing. So I do my light shading first. Then I go back in around the edges and I do, I didn't know I was learning gradients and, you know, a little bit of perspective with my, with my coloring books. And then I color a little harder, closer to the edges and then, um, Blend it in the closer I got to the center. So it would look like there was, you know, spotlights of light on my little oranges and stuff. When I tell you, you couldn't tell me nothing. You couldn't tell me nothing. But as an adult, and now looking at the fact that I create and I make for a living, I started to learn that it was at those times when I had the freedom to create and make mistakes in the dark that helped me so that when I produced and showed the 90 to 100 percent completion, people were like, oh, this is great. And they're not necessarily able to recreate or reproduce the way I do because to them, they don't see the struggle. They don't see all of the, the prices you had to pay to learn your craft, to hone your craft, to become expert at your execution. And so they believe erroneously, but still they believe that they can have these silver bullets and golden eggs. It amazes me how people (laughs) tell folks, oh, just, and I've talked about that word just, and I have to try to stop myself from saying it sometimes. Beware, whenever anybody tries to tell you something, they use the word, just do this or that. Mm -mm, It's not that easy. But I'll have people ask a complex thing and they want me to give it to them in a recipe step of step one, step two, step three. And they want to get upset if the steps don't, correctly encapsulate everything that's needed. And I shake my head in disbelief because I'm like, how can you be this ignorant of the process? But then I have to remember that a lot of these people have never gone through the creative process and they don't know what it takes and they don't have the courage and the confidence to make it through this process. And so those are some of the things that I want to make sure that if nothing else, you leave this 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 podcast today, understanding that in today's new world, everybody is still going to want to want these silver bullets and golden eggs. And you will be able, hopefully, to create one. But don't fool yourself by thinking that either you're going to do it because you're so busy telling the world what you're going to do, or that you're going to be able to do it by just picking up some easy one, two, three process. You know, this is, this is the biggest aha for me, that after having uh, written all of these books published and, you know, by the skin of my teeth every day, inking out my living, you know, as a solopreneur, the income, you know, I have to produce the income from this household. I have learned to develop the ability to give myself big advice early that is heavy on strategy uh, and understanding of the big picture and to create some definite intentions for my planned outcome. So in my last few minutes, let me break what that means down because I'm giving y'all, hopefully, some of you will catch this and some of you it'll marinate, but then you'll catch it. So let it sit on the back burner if it doesn't make sense to you. But in all of your getting, please get this part. And that is that you have to get to the point where you're able to develop your own ability to give yourself big advice. 
Big advice is that strategic advice. It's that 30,000 foot advice. It's that advice that has the long view, the long term. It's that advice that requires grit and the uh, ability to push down the need to get affirmation and feedback from others to keep going. It's that big advice that helps you to look past the immediacy of your pain and your needs to look at the long view of your your, uh, goal and your gains. It's that ability to plot out definitely what you want for your outcome and to be able to allow for contingency plans or tactics to pull off your strategy. So if your strategy is, is, is solid and you've given yourself that big idea, you've given yourself room to fail, room to change the way you go about it, but your, but your strategy is still intact. You're just picking different tactics. So many times when I was younger, I had a strategy and I was duped by the tactics saying, oh, well, uh, real estate didn't work. So I guess I missed it. Or, oh, going after this big job didn't, didn't work. So I guess I missed it. And I was getting fooled by the tactics instead of holding fast to the strategy and allowing the tactics to change as they do, learning from them as I go so that I got better at picking better tactics to help me achieve the strategy and the long-term goals that I'm working toward. And then this is another thing, and that is to quit looking and comparing yourself at what others do. Age, your age doesn't mean anything. I will tell you that if you are feeling like you missed the boat because you're not young anymore, quit listening to those people with all these uh, attrition tables of a perfect utopia where if you uh, started investing at this time, then you'll have this much money. That is not true. That is in a perfect world. We've already talked about the reason why your best laid plans don't work out and that it's a one in a billion trillion shot that the plan that you have is going to work to the exact ramifications that you stated because things happen, people are fickle, and you can't control many variables, if any. So if you find that you think you've missed the boat, you have not. Each day when you get up and you can breathe, you can think straight, you have power to move and to think, you have a a brand new day to start to to do and to do whatever it is that you said you were going to do. So don't get waylaid by that. Don't get put on the sidelines by that. But then this is another thing that I want to say, and that is wealth. And and when I say wealth, I'm not just talking about money wealth. Whether it be health, your reputation, your status in your community or in your relationships, it's all about available resources. And when you have the right seed for the best opportunities, you're able to do a lot and you're able to live in getting those types of of things that you're going after. So what do I mean by this? A lot of people are so used to the constant programming of people trying to tell you what is status and they equated by money and accumulation of things and houses and cars and all of this kind of stuff. But there are other people who they might be contrary. They might be questioners like me or whatever, and they have to see for themselves. They have to go and test it for themselves. And then they find out that, Oh, that's not for me. Now it might be for somebody else, but that's not for me. And they find that they become very wealthy based on those things that make their heart sing. And it usually comes down to having resources for the right seed for the best opportunities for them. So whatever that means for you, do not despise the wealth that you have. I had a conversation today where I had to remind someone that each person has wealth and you have to look at where your wealth springs. There is this old um, definition of wealth that um, Robert Kiyosaki talks about in Rich Dad, Poor Dad, where his rich dad told him wealth is the amount of days you can go without being dependent on someone else. And that's with regards to money. Wealth, if you take that and you, you stretch it to the other realms, it can be however many days you can go where your body does what it's supposed to and works properly, where your relationships go with how they're supposed to go based on what you're used to doing daily and they work properly. 
I bet you can tell people who who truly understand wealth when it comes to relationships, especially if they've ever gone through the dissolution or the breakdown of a, a long held relationship, especially a relationship that had legal uh, uh, legality had legalities attached to it. It's like a death. And that is not wealth. And they have a new perspective of what wealth really means. So I'm going to need you to stop thinking that the new world is like it used to be. You can't brag your way in. You can't talk big games in. You can't trick people into giving you their secrets about how they built something. You're going to have to learn to move stealthily and use few words. And on top of that, you're going to have to go through the valley of despair when you create. You're going to have to practice in the dark so that you can be fe- feel free to make mistakes because that's when you're going to hone your skills and the conceptual insights that come to you. You're going to have to practice. And then, but besides that, you'll go through this process so you can develop the ability to give yourself big advice about your strategies, your tactics, your, your intentions, and your planned outcome. and You will start to develop an eye for truly seeing the wealth that is already inherently yours with the resources that you have available for the right seed that you want to plant for the best opportunities. And so thankfully, you will have hopefully gotten some wisdom about yourself to continue to move forward in this new world that we find ourselves in. So guess what? Yes, y'all, my time is up. I thank you for yours. This has been Michelle Spiva, your practical priestess of wisdom with another podcast of Wisdom Smack. Don't forget to check the show notes. There are ways people have asked me. Yes, you can directly uh, contribute to the podcast. The links are there. And because this is a daily podcast, I am going to see you tomorrow. Bye. And that's going to do it for today's podcast of Wisdom Smack with Michelle Spiva. If you like this podcast, please help us get the word out. Like, comment, subscribe, and even share. And if you really like it, please help us continue to get the word out by considering using this show's link for Amazon. So when you want to go to Amazon and you do all of your general shopping, Uh, please use michellespiva.com forward slash AMZ. It's simple as that. It doesn't cost you anything extra. And this show might receive a little bit of commission that will go towards helping to further get these episodes out to you and to others. So thank you so much for listening. This has been Michelle Spiva with Wisdom Smack. Bye.